Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Job Accommodation Network's Accommodation and Compliance Audio and Web Training Series. I'm Linda Batiste, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's program called Assistive Technology Basics. We're going to be featuring Lisa Mathis, Lead Consultant for the Motor Team, and Teresa Goddard, Lead Consultant on Jan's Sensory Team. Before we get started, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping items. First, if any of you experience technical difficulties during the webcast, please give us a call at 800-526-7234 for voice and hit button 5 when the automated system picks up. Or for TTY, call 877-781-9403. Second, we plan to have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation, time allowing. So please send in your questions at any time during the webcast to our email account, which is question at askjan.org, or you can use our question and answer pod located at the bottom of your screen. To use that pod, you're just going to type in your question and then submit to the question queue. Also on the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a webcast download pod that you can use if you have difficulty viewing the slides or if you just want to download them. And finally, I want to remind you that at the end of the webcast, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window. We really appreciate and use your feedback, so please stay logged on to fill out the evaluation form. And now, Teresa is going to start today's program. Teresa? Thanks for that great introduction, Linda. Today, Lisa and I will be getting back to the basics of AT, or assistive technology. Whether you're a complete beginner or an experienced provider of workplace accommodations, we hope you'll take something of value from today's presentation. We're going to be talking about newer developments as well as some familiar favorites. So what is assistive technology? Assistive technology, uh, or sometimes we use the term AT, could mean any device or service that can be used as a tool by a person with a disability in order to achieve or maintain function. But I often think of it as, as just a type of tool that can be used to make a task easier to do. Some people will say that the term assistive technology should only be used to refer to technology used by people with disabilities, but in fact there are many technologies that are widely used today that were once commonly used by workers and students with disabilities, and now they're used by many, many people across the world to make tasks either more intuitive or more ergonomic or even just to prevent workplace injuries from occurring. On this screen, we have some examples of assistive technology. To the left, we have a touch screen. Uh, in many cases, people who prefer a touch screen can find monitors or devices that have touch screens built in. However, we do get questions about external touch screens that would be attached to a monitor, uh, such as you're seeing here on this slide. Um, that is something that we hear about at JAN from time to time. In the center, we have a Genie Load Lifter, which is a type of compact lifting device suitable for lifting things like boxes. And uh, as I said, sometimes these might be used by a person, for example, with a back impairment who has difficulty lifting, but they might also be used by other workers to prevent injuries. I once took a call from an employer who got so excited about the Genie Load Lifter that he said he was going to buy one for each side of his company just to prevent workplace injuries. And to the right, we have a uh, box copy of Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is an example of speech to text software. Now this particular uh, type of software comes in multiple versions depending on your industry and it lets one type with one's voice. So now I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of traditional assistive technology versus mainstream devices. So traditional assistive technologies are designed for the use of persons um, with disabilities. Some examples would include things like magnifiers that make things easier to see, alternative keyboards that might be easier for someone with a hand impairment to use, or various software options for people with learning disabilities. And mainstream devices or software are more widely used, but they can be very useful as accommodations too. For example, what might once have been an add-on specialty feature might now be built in so that anyone can use it. For instance, we now have speech recognition, speech output, word prediction, color contrast, and alternative input devices as standard features on things that we use every day like computers and tablets and smartphones. On the right side of the screen, uh, sorry, on the uh, left side of the screen that is, uh, we have a picture of a trackball. 
And this is something that you might have seen uh, in a classroom, perhaps for students with disabilities. And something like this uh, would be kind of it designed with the intention that it would be used by someone with a hand impairment. But people without hand impairments can benefit from them also, and some look more, you know, office friendly. Logitech carries one that is in kind of a darker hue. And on the right, we have a picture of a, of a smartphone. And what we're seeing is many makers of assistive technology are developing apps for use on smartphones and tablets. So they're not just making dedicated devices anymore. Some companies are making both dedicated devices and things that you might use on a smart device. Now, when we think of assistive technology, we might automatically move toward thinking of high-tech, futuristic devices rather than just simple modifications. On this slide, we have a picture of a woman who's communicating with a coworker through a type of robotic device, which is a newer technology that could be useful for someone who works from home. This type of technology is sometimes called a telepresence device. This technology is actually already being used to accommodate some workers in Japan, but in the US, such devices are more commonly used to provide telehealth services in healthcare industries. So this allows a healthcare professional to serve someone who might be located far away from them. But often AT is low tech and can be implemented very, fairly easily. Workspace modifications can often be made at little to no cost and there are all kinds of inexpensive devices. For example, on the screen we have a gripping aid. Uh, we would call this a ball grip, but you may have seen DIY versions of this type of gripping aid made with tennis balls or even duct tape. AT might also be custom designed or a modified version. And customizing doesn't have to cost a lot. Removing the legs of a computer desk can be a very low cost custom modification for an individual of short stature. Now let's go over some typical types of assistive technology that might be used in a workplace environment. When I started at JAN, I was on the motor team, and that's Lisa's team now. Many, many of our questions on that team were about different ways to get information into a computer other than using a standard keyboard and mouse. Of course, there are many, many types of alternative keyboards and alternative mice, uh, such as the trackball that we saw on the earlier screen. And the trackballs have been around forever. But one solution that has improved by leaps and bounds over the last few years is speech recognition software. Now, sometimes we call this speech-to-text software. I first started using it in the early 2000s, and honestly, it was just terrible. I really wanted to throw my laptop <laughs> out a window. <laughs> well, Lisa, you laugh, but you're, you're just lucky that I lived in an apartment that was on the first floor. Right. <laughs> So on this slide, we have a picture of Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is one example of software in this category. Some operating systems, apps, and uh, mobile or home use devices have speech recognition built in. But uh, it can only be eye-opening to learn how much data leaves your device or your computer system and gets stored elsewhere when you're using some of these devices. So I say always be aware of the content of your manuals and your user agreements. Know what you're getting into. Of course, the term speech-to-text is easily confused with the term text-to-speech, and that, of course, does the reverse. On this slide, we have a picture of the software Zoom Text Magnifier with Speech. This software makes things on the screen larger and easier to see, but it also has some speech output capability, which means it'll read some of the things that are on the screen out loud to you. It's very different from a full-featured text-to-speech program like the screen reading program JAWS, uh, but a perpetual license for this is available for uh, around $500 depending on the type that you're getting, um, whereas something that's more full-featured is going to cost quite a bit more. Both screen reading software and screen magnification software are examples of alternative output methods. And what we mean by that is just a different way of getting information from the computer other than just looking at a standard screen. And there's also software that combines features of both. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Next, I want to take a minute to show you some of the more commonly requested products in the sensory category. At uh, JAN, the sensory team takes questions on a lot of different things, 
but our primary areas are accommodations involving the senses. So sometimes I say we're eyes, ears, nose, and communication. So on the left, we have an example of an air purifier. The sensory team takes a lot of questions about respiratory conditions, and as a result, we get a lot of questions about air purifiers. This one in particular is called Molecule, uh, but it's Molecule spelled with a K. And it's a kind of a higher end model. It runs around $800. Uh, we have it in our JAN database. And this particular one is an example of an air purifier that helps to deal with a number of types of irritants and allergens. And according to their promotional materials, it can also help with viruses that are airborne. In the center, kind of toward the top, we have the Colorino, a color identifier, which is an example of a color identification device. Basically, you can use this device to figure out what color something is. Uh, it's a pretty basic you know, point and push button interface, and it'll say the color of whatever you're using it to identify out loud. Uh, and you can also attach an earpiece to it for privacy purposes. It's really good for things like sorting papers and clothing by color. Generally, it's uh, over 200 but under 250, depending on where you would go to buy it. Sometimes we get questions about whether it can be used to detect bruising on skin. I'm not sure it's quite that sensitive. But if you've had success in doing that, uh, please call in. We'd love to hear about it. And there are also lower cost uh, things like apps that work similarly. But this is an example of a really durable and reliable standalone product. In the lower right, we have an example of an FM type assistive listening device. And this particular one is from Williams Sound. You can get it through a variety of retailers, including Harris Communications. And Hear More is another site that carries products from Williams Sound. Now, you may be familiar with the name because they also make the Pocket Talker line of assistive devices. And those are smaller and simpler, a little bit easier to use. We also get a lot of questions about ways to make a telephone louder for an employee who is hard of hearing. On this slide, we have an example of a telephone amplifier that is very adjustable in comparison to similar products. It's called the Speech Adjust to Tone. It's from a company called Hearsay, but you can also get it through other vendors like Harris Communications. The Speech Adjust to Tone is unique in that it has multiple sliders, and you can adjust the volume of the incoming call differently for different frequencies. So if someone needs to hear um, the higher pitches a little bit better, but they're OK with lower pitch sounds, they can adjust those sliders accordingly. Now, depending on the model and accessories used, sometimes you can also use something like this with a telecoil-enabled hearing aid. But you have to be careful to get the correct model for the need. So now let's dig into an accommodation example. A nurse with a hearing impairment worked the night shift. And she had to talk to doctors who were calling in for information. She was having difficulty hearing over the telephone. The employee asked to be moved to a day shift where there would be other nurses who could talk to the doctors. But there weren't any openings on the day shift. And honestly, I question whether they would have had to restructure the job in that way or not anyway. As an accommodation, the employer purchased a telephone amplifier which enabled the nurse to hear effectively over the telephone. So in the picture, we have an example of a very simple and inexpensive telephone amplification device. Now, this type is designed to slip over the receiver portion, of like a traditional wall or desk telephone. The advantage is that it's very intuitive and easy to move from one telephone to another. I'm not sure of the exact model, but this one looks very similar to the Ryzen portable telephone amplifier. And that gives you about 30 dB of amplification for just under $15. Now, a lot of healthcare settings are moving over to newer technologies like uh, mobile phones. And when you're using those, you need to be careful to pay attention to things like the HAC rating, which will tell you how well it works, say, with a hearing aid. And now I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail on screen reading and uh, screen magnification. Pictured, we have the software program Zoom Text Fusion, which combines the features of the screen magnification program Zoom Text, which many people are familiar with. It makes things on the screen larger as well as easier to see in other ways, like by adjusting contrast and foreground and background colors. 
and it combines these features with the features of the screen reading program, JAWS. And Zoom Text, you'll remember, is also available without those screen reading features. A similar program to uh, Zoom Text with Reader, and also uh, with some similarities to Zoom Text Fusion, is Dolphin Supernova. And the feedback that we've gotten from users, we don't talk to as many people who use the Dolphin line of products, but the feedback we get is that people really like the color customization option, and uh, that it's more popular among college-age students. Many employers, however, tend to be more familiar with the Zoom Text line of products, and oftentimes they'll already have a license for that. Let's look at another example. A healthcare worker with low vision was having difficulty using her computer. We see this a lot in healthcare settings. Um, when it comes to healthcare databases, some are more accessible than others, and some hospitals are more open to assistive technologies than others. Uh, we've actually heard of nurses leaving their jobs to go back to a hospital that had technology and databases that worked better for them. I, I really hope we can get to a place where there's um, no need to do that. So in this case, at first, the employer tried upgrading the employee's operating system. And the reason for that is that newer versions of operating systems sometimes have more accessibility features. Unfortunately, that wasn't effective. The employer purchased screen magnification software, and as a result, they were able to retain a highly valued skilled employee and also sent a message to her department that we care, even in a big company. And here we have some examples of screen reading software. Uh, the NVDA screen reader uh, is one that a lot of people haven't heard much about. It can actually be downloaded free of charge by anyone, uh, but they do accept donations. And uh, they do sell things like training manuals and telephone support services, etc. cetera. Uh, the Dolphin screen reader uh, is similar to JAWS in that it's primarily for screen reading, uh, but it runs just under $800. And for JAWS, the screen reading program that people are usually most familiar with, it's extremely full-featured, uh, and there's a lot of user support. A professional perpetual license for that goes for about $1,500. So I would really encourage people to consider the features that they need, and perhaps um, try demo versions of a couple of different types of products before they make a decision. And, but in addition, as we'll talk later, it's very important to involve the IT team when deciding what software a person is going to use at work. Let's look at another example. So here we have an example where a piece of assistive technology that's traditionally used for accommodating someone with a vision impairment was used in a different way. A bus garage employee who had difficulty reading but had excellent listening comprehension skills often missed important instructions and announcements that were sent by email. The employee was provided with screen reading software that allowed him to listen to the emails that he received. His performance greatly improved, and his attendance at meetings and gatherings improved also, probably because he knew when they were happening. Now, a big computer monitor is usually one of the first accommodation ideas that people want to try when they're adjusting um, to a new or to a progressive vision loss. And people sometimes ask, how big can you get in terms of monitors? Well, this picture will give you just a little glimpse into life at Jan. This is the screen in our innovation conference room, and as you can see, it is quite large. The advantage of a larger monitor uh, is not only that everything on the screen is a bit bigger, but you also have more real estate to work with in terms of screen magnification software. Now, before modern screen magnification programs came into use, I used to know a teacher who uh, had to get a special program from the school to write their IEPs. And those are individualized education plans for students with disabilities. They actually projected from their computer up onto a wall in order to make things big enough for them to see well. Now, you do lose some contrast when you do it that way, so it's not what I usually suggest, but you know, sometimes you just have to use what you can get. Now, I don't know of anybody who's using a monitor like the one that we have in the innovation room, I mean, just the desk alone. You'd have to move your head around. It would be very uncomfortable to use something of this size. And that's why I really suggest that people stay with the you know, screen magnification software options. A little bit bigger is good. 
too big might be too much. So let's look at another example. And you know, this might be an exception to my no large monitor rules. You know, don't have a monitor more than twice the size of your head is what I sometimes say. But this might be an exception. A psychologist who was legally blind asked to be excused from providing mental health services via telehealth. Now the employer was temporarily restructuring her job to allow for this. They were looking for some solutions uh, that would help her be able to return to doing that function. And what she was most concerned about was being able to interpret her client's facial expression and their body language via a video feed. Because you know it's different when you're right in the room. Now I was I was impressed that they were actually restructuring while they were looking for a solution. So a Jan consultant talked with him about larger monitors and talked about maybe exploring ways of changing the positioning of the cameras on the patient side, so the cameras that were actually on the patient in that room, to help her improve her chance to observe body language. So this is a case where uh, a very large uh, monitor of some type or, or even a TV screen might be used uh, to give her a really um, targeted view of the face but also maybe a broader view of the person's body language. You might even possibly have you know, two cameras and two different, um, maybe two different monitors, perhaps a split screen, so that she could see both at the same time. A telepresence device is another option that could be considered, um, because that lets the person use like a remote control sometimes to, to pan the camera, tilt, even to move forward and back. But for this setting and for this patient population, they were looking for a more familiar technology, uh, and they were, you know, they were just more favorable to using some things that were similar to what they already had in place. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about speech generating solutions for a moment. Here we have some solutions for those who use AAC. Sometimes that's called augmentative and alternative communication. Don't remember that. There won't be a quiz on that. Um, a lot of people will call it speech generating technology. And these are some solutions for telephone use. Of course, if you've ever seen a speech generating device, uh, you could either type or use uh, buttons or a touch screen, um, perhaps even a keyboard to generate words and phrases that you want to have the device say out loud in a synthetic voice. And it's possible to use a lot of these with the speakerphone function on a telephone. But we get a lot of calls from employers who want a more private option. So here are just some examples. On the left, we have a device called the Phone Link, which can be used to connect uh, almost any type of speech output device that has the right kind of jack, a 3.5 jack, to a desktop type telephone. I've actually had a chance to try this out with the Speech Assistant AAC app that you see pictured there on the right side of the slide. And as you can see, the Speech Assistant AAC app lets you use pre-programmed words and phrases, but you can also type in anything you want um, into that speech generation box. And when you hit the button that looks like a little speaker, it'll say the whole thing out loud. So just an example, this is a screenshot from the app, and it says, hi, my name is Teresa. Do you have questions about AT? So hi, my name is, was canned. It was very easy to just push one button and enter that. And then I used the on-screen keyboard to enter the rest. And the way you would use this with a tablet or a phone, again, assuming it has the right kind of jack. My old phone has the right kind of jack. The new phone doesn't. You just plug one end into the phone, the smartphone, and the other end into your desk phone. Uh, and then the sound uh, from whatever device you're using the app on goes directly into the phone. Now, in the lower part of the screen, we have another device called the Cero phone. That's S-E-R-O. And that can be used to deliver pre-recorded messages. It can also interface with, with some infrared-enabled devices, but not all. So in order to avoid compatibility issues, what we suggest is contacting the vendor directly to make sure that whatever you're hoping to use it with is actually going to be compatible. Now, just as a side note, the quality of synthetic speech is often a big concern for employers. 
and sometimes for users of AAC as well. There are now companies that specialize in custom synthetic voices and in voice banking. So some examples are Vocal ID and Acapella Inclusive. What voice banking is, uh, is it's a way to pre-record your voice and it lets you restore recordings for future use in developing a customized voice. So if you know that you have a medical condition that's likely to impact your voice, um, let's say certain types of cancer, you might want to do voice banking so that you will have a synthetic voice that sounds very much like your current voice that you can use after treatment is completed. And now Lisa's going to tell you about some organizational software. Take it away, Lisa. <laughs> Good job, Teresa, the technology queen. Okay, so let's change gears a moment and take a look at some AT options that we can consider for cognitive impairment. First, we do have the umbrella category of organization software, which can refer to programs that assist individuals with keeping schedules, maintaining organization, and the daily activities of life and work. So here on the screen, we have a screenshot of the AbleLink Endeavor 3, which the app costs about $100, and it's available in Google Play and the Apple uh, Store. Um, so this this product, many individuals, including people with intellectual disabilities, TBIs, early onset dementia, and certain learning disabilities, um, individuals could have difficulty remembering when to perform key activities, such as taking medications, turning off appliances, getting to meetings and appointments, work tasks, and other routine or non-routine activities of daily living. So the Endeavor 3 provides a format for those individuals to complete tasks independently and on time. So this often frees up staff or caregiving time and greatly enhancing the individual's independence and quality of life. So this app, uh, it has a simple mix of an image, an audio message, and a set day and time, and then it's presented on the home screen. But this app also runs in the background, so if you're using your smart tablet or device for other things, this app will interrupt um, to remind you of appointments and work tasks. And so we often see that these types of apps can serve as a standalone accommodation option or as an accompaniment to a work-related aid or a job coach until the person is back uh, fully independent uh, and can rely on the app on their own. So here's an example. We have an electrical apprentice with some intellectual issues who needs to go to licensure training to become certified. He had a hard time taking notes and remembering information in those trainings. So the result was the employee was provided with an iPad with apps that let him record the training so he could go back after the training and re-listen to the lecture as often as necessary to help him prepare for that training um, test. So the key point here, once, the, once given the accommodation of an iPad, he was provided training on the iPad. So this helps ensure that he knows how to use it and it's truly effective for him. So training on any assistive technology we provide as an accommodation, I think, is a key point in the interactive process. So another AT option for cognitive impairments here we have a screenshot of the WatchMinder smartwatch. It runs about $70. So this is a watch with a timer that vibrates so it's discreet and it's not announcing to everyone that you have an accommodation in place because it, under ADA it is uh, important to remember dignity issues should be considered. So it's very discreet and personal. And it's designed to help people in staying focused, managing their time, and modifying their thoughts and behaviors. So you can set up specific times for these alerts, or you can just set up interval timers, and it will go off every 15 minutes, for example, just to give you a quick buzz and let you know either to wrap up and move on or keep moving on with the task at hand. So looking at an example, we have a pediatrician with ADHD who is having a hard time meeting performance standards at work. They had a patient quota, and she was staying late to finish her duties. So then coworkers were picking up extra patients and the employer had to pay those coworkers overtime. So it started to become an issue. 
So they tried a, different, a few different accommodations but couldn't find something effective, so they ended up calling Jan. So after a consultation with Jan, they ended up providing a WatchMinder watch. They had programmed it to vibrate every five minutes, which enabled the employee to pace herself throughout the day and keep up with production standards. So in this instance, the employer reported a $100 cost and did report the benefit that an accommodation was made and the employee was able to improve performance. So there's also some alternative solutions we could always consider. Here we have a picture of the Revive watch, which costs about $150. It has additional features depending on which model you go with. So we have the standard silent vibration alert, but we can also program short text reminders to pop up on the screen at certain times of day. So that's just one option of an alternative. There are various smartwatches available now. I feel like everyone has the Apple Watch, which is great, but being connected to your cell phone can also cause a slew of distractions and um, issues with productivity if you're always also getting your texts and calls through the Apple Watch. So it's just important to consider what would be effective for the employee. More features and more bells and whistles aren't always the best option. So you want to talk with the employee and see what they truly need. Okay, so now we're switching gears to look at some motor-related assistive technology. Something that people get tripped up on a lot is the compact lifting device versus the work platform. So in my experience, when we're referring to a compact lifting device, we're talking about devices that are small and portable enough to work in an office or a tight warehouse environment. So these lifting and carrying devices um, do have platforms that are variable heights, and they're typically used for moving materials or goods, but not the employee themselves. But on the other hand, we have um, work platforms, which are the middle and the right photo up on the screen right now. Those work platforms are adjustable height workstations that can be adjusted to optimum heights or fixed height platforms to raise the employee to the working level. So these are made for people to stand on or wheelchairs in some instances. So when we're looking at choosing among effective options in assistive technology, we want to know, are we lifting material or are we better off lifting the worker? You'll want to understand the environment or task at hand when choosing which would be better. And I do just want to say, on the left, we have the, it was once ergodynamics, but now it's hardy lift. Um, and then in the middle, we have a scissor lift platform by JLG, I believe. And then on the right, we have global industrial work platform, which costs about $1,300. All right, so let's look at another motor-related product and some examples. Now we have an adjustable workstation, which are desks and tables that are adjustable and allow individuals who use mobility aids to access them. But they also allow an individual to alternate between sitting and standing positions throughout the day to help be more comfortable. We also have vendor lists for office setting uh, adjustable workstations versus the industrial adjustable workstations. So depending what you're looking for, we may have something different for you. On this example, uh, hits close to home. We have an employment consultant with sciatic nerve pain. So sitting for eight hours was painful and they were having a hard time throughout their day. So the individual talks to Jan, learned their rights under the ADA, learned how to request a reasonable accommodation, and in this case, the employer approved and provided them with an adjustable workstation. This made the employee happy and comfortable and enabled them to keep up with production standards. So as Teresa mentioned, speech recognition software, which is sometimes referred to as speech-to-text, um, it's becoming increasingly popular and readily available. Here we do have drag in by nuance pictured as it's pretty popular. But if you want to test speech to text out, there's built in options on computers um, that you could try out and play with and see if that's what's right for you. But some people may need a more advanced option. So speech recognition software might be a better fit than what their computer offers as a built in accessibility feature. Speech recognition allows the user to access the computer by using their voice. It can be useful for those with motor impairments who cannot type 
or those with cognitive impairments who have difficulty in writing and documentation. There are options if you would need both speech recognition and screen reading software um, through a product called JSAY. And for those who need to talk on the phone while inputting information at the same time, which is common for customer service reps, it could be possible to integrate speech recognition with their telephone. And we also have a vendor list for those products. So let's look at a, different cup, a couple different applications of, of speech recognition. First up, we have an activities aid in an extended living facility had difficulty writing documentation in a daily log for the group she assisted. I want to assume that the difficulty writing was a cognitive issue. Perhaps a learning disability was causing these issues. So for the accommodation, we have the aid was provided with speech detect software, which allowed her to dictate her notes from the computer, print them out, and then cut and place them into the binder. So here we have a speech recognition as a successful accommodation. Another example, now we have a case manager a nurse case manager with a newly acquired hand impairment and they were struggling to complete patient documentation. Performance was suffering and was falling behind company quota. So now with the writing issues, it's a motor related issue. For the accommodation, a JN consultant explained speech recognition, specifically Dragon Medical that's used in the healthcare industry. This enabled the employee to complete patient documentation in a timely manner. So with this software, there's basic dictation options, but there's also occupational specific ones. There's this medical version, and there's a legal version, and it's really just a larger range of vocabulary unique to those work settings, which makes it easier for the in individual using them. Now I wanted to highlight a couple of products that not a lot of people are aware that exist, both of these products pictured are from Dane Technology. On the left, we have a motorized wheelchair pusher. Um, it is a little costly at $7,500, but it makes it easier for medical staff to push patients up ramps across carpeted areas, um, and it reduces strain on employees. So hospitals these days are huge, and we're getting more and more healthcare workers getting work-related injuries and impairments from on-the-job issues, and so these motorized wheelchair pushers are becoming increasingly popular. Then on the right, we have a motorized pusher for wheeled carts and dollies. So it's pretty much like a tow truck for these uh, case carts, hospitality equipment, hospital equipment, medical equipment, and food trolleys. So again, even though something is wheeled, if you're putting a bunch of weight on it, it can still bog it down. So these motorized devices make it easier for the employee to push those goods and materials. Okay, so how much does AT cost? So with the JAN study that we annually update, over half of accommodations, employers reported no cost. And of those, 36% reported there may be a one-time cost, but it was typically less than $500. So these number, numbers aren't speaking directly to assistive technology per se, but they are representative of all accommodations that employers reported on. But I do think it gives a kind of general idea of what we're looking at in terms of money with accommodations. So in short, an accommodation is cheaper than an iPhone um, in this day and age. So I think that's very beneficial and promising for employers and individuals alike. Okay, so looking at how to meet complex needs with assistive technology. So here on the left of our graphic of the arrow, ABLE data. This is a database that's basically a catch-all for any AT device ever available. Um, that, and you can't buy from them directly, but they have the information on past items and current items with the vendor information of where you can find available products or types of products that may work. So whenever an individual calls us or an employer and they're just looking for basic ideas of where to start, I think Able Data is a great place to start out of let's see what is on the market or once existed that met this unique need. And then moving on the arrow, we have eBay. So we see this a lot of that people get attached to one certain product and they use it for years and years and years and then it gets discontinued. 
well, eBay is a great resource that someone else may have also tried that product, don't have a need for it anymore, trying to make some cash. So they put the gently used item on eBay. So the person with a disability can go to eBay and find this product that isn't commercially available anymore. So I think eBay is kind of a hidden gem of AT products. Moving on to state AT projects, same idea. It can You can find used or borrowed items that may, may not be commercially available anymore. And then there's RESNA, the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society for North America. They customize AT for a specific need and application. Uh, me and Teresa were actually traveling and we once saw them at a conference with this modified workstation for a cashier at a fast food restaurant who used a wheelchair. It was amazing. Um, so Resna does super custom customizable work. And then same premise for agribility, custom things in an AT database, but for agricultural applications. So there's lots of tractors, outside terrain, rough use items on agribility sites. And then lastly, there's going to be times that in-house customization is going to have to be considered. Some work tasks and needs are so unique that in-house is going to have to create something to be effective for an employee in some cases. Do you have anything to add, Teresa? Well, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned Able Data because that's something that I use all the time to look up products that might no longer be in the JAN database because they're not commercially available. Or, you know, if I'm unfamiliar with the name, we had somebody call in just a couple of weeks ago looking for a cat tail phone, C-A-T, T-A-I-L phone, and um, I thought I knew what they meant. You probably think you know too. But just in case, I went to eBay or to uh, Able Data to see if there was something I didn't know about. Found a lot of stuff. Turned out it was a cap tail phone, like you're all thinking. Uh, and uh, cap tail, C A P T E L, cap tail. Minor details. But you know, it, it pays to check because mm -hmm. suppose we had missed something important. Absolutely. Um, now for eBay, that's actually extremely common with users of AAC devices. People will get very attached to a device, sometimes because the person um, may have a, a neurological concern like um, like autism that makes them really strongly prefer not to change devices. Or it could be because uh, their fine motor abilities are so specific that there's one device that works for them. Now the one thing we didn't talk about on this slide is Occasionally, you can get in on some type of R&D project. So the cool new thing in AAC is brain-controlled interfaces. And what's neat about these is they don't actually require any volitional movement whatsoever to activate a switch or, in some cases, to spell. So um, if you were at ATIA or if you're going to be at CSUN, you may get to hear about some projects where people could no longer get their preferred AAC device but were able to get in on some uh, trials involving brain-controlled interfaces where you actually use your brain waves uh, to do things like spell out something on a device. People are actually using these for work, but you can't buy them. It's only if you get in on some type of research project that you're able to get this you know, really cutting-edge technology. Okay, from the exciting to policy. <laughs> <laughs> so mobile devices, like tablets, cell phones, smartphones, smartwatches, and any of the other types of wearable technologies can be very valuable productivity tools when they're used appropriately. Uh, they can help employees maintain work-life balance, use concentration and relaxation techniques, reminders. Uh, some of them can help you manage your health condition and uh, keep in touch with sources of support without tying up office equipment and phone lines. But devices can also serve as a distraction or even pose a risk to data. And as a result, a lot of employers are developing and updating policies on personal use devices and governing what types of devices and apps can be purchased for employees. One challenge that we're seeing a lot is employers limiting the use of Bluetooth-enabled devices in their workplaces. And this is a real challenge for people who use things like Bluetooth hearing aids uh, or even more crucial health devices like continuous blood glucose monitors. Some people need to be able to constantly monitor their blood glucose um, in order to intervene appropriately when they go too high or too low in their blood sugar, and they really do need to know what those numbers are at all times. But there are employers who, uh, for policy reasons, don't want to allow these devices on their work campuses. Uh, it, it's a growing area of challenge. When we talk about the ADA and a wearable device policy, 
Some important things to keep in mind are that policies need to be applied in a non-discriminatory way. In some cases, it might be necessary to consider modifying a policy unless it's an undue hardship to do so. And it might help when you're trying to figure out what to do in terms of applying your policy to help figure out whether something is a personal use item or something necessary for an accommodation. There are some wearable devices that are really designed to meet a disability-specific need. For example, um, the ORCAM, O-R-C-A-M, is something that you wear. It uh, usually would attach to the side piece of eyeglasses, and it, it can actually read text similarly to the way that a screen reader reads text, but it would read text, say, from a piece of paper, and it's designed for someone with a vision impairment or a reading disability. Uh, that could be a personal use item if people use it all the time and everywhere, but it also might be a workplace accommodation. Uh, and sometimes you might, the employer and the employee both, might need to be open to alternate ideas or accommodations. But people use these types of wearable devices in all types of, of ways. They could be used to you know, manage their stress, manage a medical condition like diabetes. Uh, you could use the OrCam to get information. You might be using uh, some of these devices to meet communication needs, you know, like a hearing aid. That's very necessary for communication. But these are just some things to keep in mind if you have a mobile device policy or you're considering implementing one. So let's talk about an example just really quickly. An employee at a community college, uh, presumably they use the hearing aid because they're asking for a Bluetooth streamer. And a Bluetooth streamer is something that we'd, you would usually use with a Bluetooth-enabled hearing aid so that you can send the sound of other things, like a computer or a telephone or a television, uh, into your hearing aid via Bluetooth to be amplified. So uh, they were asking for this Bluetooth streamer to assist with their access to meetings and trainings and to enhance day-to-day -day conversation. I'm surprised they weren't asking about using it on the phone because that's a very typical application. So the employer wanted to buy it, but they also wanted to put some rules in place to make sure that it didn't get damaged at work. And I'm not sure what they thought was going to happen because like, this wasn't a lifeguard. Uh, this was somebody working in, you know, in an office at a community college, and I, I, I don't know what they thought was going to happen to the device, but they were concerned. Wanted to make a policy. There's always someone who wants to make a policy, and it's never me, but I appreciate those people. They keep me in line. So they got on the phone with Jan. We talked with him about some guidance on how who, who purchases something, who pays for something, impacts who gets to control things like where it's stored and how it's used, et cetera. And after learning more about that guidance, the employer's HR department decided uh, to provide an assistive listening device. Technically, a Bluetooth streamer can be a component of an assistive listening device system. We don't know exactly what they bought. We know they spent less than $1,000. So I'm going to guess here they may have bought the Bluetooth streaming device, but it's also very possible that they bought something else that they were more confident in. They did report that the accommodation was extremely effective and improved worker productivity, morale, and safety, <laughs> and uh, let them save on workers' comp. For $1,000, that's pretty good. And they also retained their employee. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about how to figure out what to get in terms of assistive technology for an employee. We've talked about a lot of different products and types of products today. There's a lot of things that we didn't talk about. We could go all day on this stuff. How do you know what to get? We have some suggestions. First, we suggest that you talk with the employee to see if they have ideas or preferences based on what they've used before. Um, maybe they've even had an assistive technology evaluation from a professional who's made some recommendations. And those might tell you not only products that would meet the person's needs, but the features of those products in case you need to go with an alternative. It's also crucial to involve the employer's IT team, depending on how the assistive technology uh, is going to be used. The IT department might have some policies that influence what can be installed and how it can be used. Now, of course, we do sometimes have to consider modifying policies, but there are logical reasons for these policies to be in place, and they might meet important operational needs like data security. It's very important to involve IT. 
And sometimes it can also be helpful for members of the IT team to have the opportunity to have some ADA training or training in how to support um, particular types of accommodations. For example, somebody might learn how to write scripts for screen reading software users. Can you try before you buy? Sometimes you can. State AT projects can be a very valuable resource where you can uh, have devices demonstrated. Uh, sometimes you can borrow a device for you know a, a week, sometimes even two weeks or a month just to see how it works in your setting. And they often offer other programs too, like reutilization a program, where perhaps a person with a disability might get something at a lower cost, or we can avoid sending um, sending a device uh, to the trash and someone can use it. And there are state financing programs, again, these are usually for people with disabilities. But employers can really benefit from device demonstrations and device loans. Now, Lisa's going to tell you some more about places to find information about assistive technologies. Take it away, Lisa. <laughs> um, we've gone over many of these, um, the ABLE data, the agribilities. We did mention ATA, ATIA and other AT conferences right now, half, of our, <laughs> half of our crews at CSUN, I hope they're enjoying California, um, RESNA, the state AT projects, uh, the CAP, the Computer and Electronic Accommodation Program, specific for federal workers, if you're a federal employee, tap into that, go down um, to the CAP Center and play and get your hands on this technology and see if that would be feasible in your work environment. And that's a program for free that if it would be, meet your needs and you are in one of the federal agencies that they work with, you can take it back to your workstation and be a happy camper. Um, then the Helen Keller National Center. Teresa, do you have anything to add about that? You know, the Helen Keller National Center for uh, Deaf, Blind, Youth, and Adults, HKNC, is just an amazing program providing services for people who are deaf, blind. Um, trainings at their headquarters and also at other sites around the country. But one thing that's very useful for employers is they have regional representatives uh, that can help connect individuals with different types of services and trainings. Sometimes they can even come on site and do consultation as part of a workplace accommodation need. Very valuable service. And you can find your regional rep on their website. Okay, so moving on. Um, we just wanted to plug some JAN resources that if you wanted more AT information, we have the publication with a five-step process to help choosing uh, among effective AT options. And then we have a JAN training, basically a training in a CAN. There's one specific for AT and workplace. It's about 20 minutes, and it gives a really good overview of available options. Now I think we do have a few moments for question and answers. Great, thank you guys, that was excellent. We do have quite a few questions. Um, we'll try to get it to as many of these as we can. Um, let's just jump in. Um, the screen reading software come with a feature to slow down speech? Um, yes and no. People who use screen readers habitually will often turn up the speed to um, speeds that the average person would have difficulty understanding, but you can vary that, so it, it's possible to listen at a lower speed than the average user would typically use, yes. All right, great. Um, in regard to speech recognition software, um, say you have someone working as a customer service rep who has to talk and type um, while talking. What is used to make sure they can get the information in the computer while talking to the customer? There is speech recognition telephone integration software. It's linked on our website. Um, I don't have the name of the product specifically, but I've heard really good reviews from customer service reps that there's basically a toggle between talking to the customer and dictating to your computer. Yeah, people can also make use of their mute button when they're when they're dictating. Yeah, easy fix. Ooh, that's a nice one. That's free. <laughs> um, do either of you have any experience with Google Live Transcribe? It's not something we've had a chance to demo yet here, um, but I have I have seen the Google product at work. Um, we're seeing, I, I would almost call it an explosion uh, in terms of uh, apps and devices that will do automated transcribing. And we have a number of those in our database. If you'd like to call in and discuss it in depth, I'd be happy to talk. This is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> and she, she means it when she says that. 
Um, someone said they, they missed something when you were talking about Dragon Naturally Speaking, and they wanted to clarify, does the program require that you record words prior to actually using the program? Oh, um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, there is a training component just so it learns your voice and kind of your twang or um, accent, if you will. <laughs> And so it kind of learns your voice, and that's going to make for a better experience. But I'm not aware of recording anything prior. No, there's there's a setup process where it does learn your speech uh, to an extent. Like, like Lisa says, you train it to your voice. It used to take, gosh, 45 minutes minimum, but um, I can get up and running in about 10 minutes now, and I don't have to record anything. Um, it, well, I assume it does some type of recording, but... Um, not in the way that I think the person is describing here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is from an individual who uses Dragon Naturally Speaking, and I don't know if it's a he or she, but we'll say he says that um, he's having difficulty in the pre-hiring process when a typing test is required and getting an employer to let him use his Dragon Naturally Speaking to take that pre-hiring typing test. Could either of you speak to that? He may need to request an accommodation for testing modifications. The test should be job-related um, and consistent with business necessity. So if he could kind of show his abilities typing, perhaps with voice-to-text, then that should be considered as an accommodation pre-hire. And we've seen some situations where people who are clients of vocational rehabilitation worked with their VR counselor to uh, take the test in a proctored environment using their assistive technology. All right, great. Um, somebody asked if there, if we know of cheaper alternatives to the Endeavor 3. Do either of you know anything about that? There's all types on our, um, on our website. For the organization software, there's all types of price points. There's free. I know the Endeavor is $100. There's apps that are in between. And apps are ever-changing, always being added to. So I... I'm sure there's organization software available for cheaper. Yeah, the Endeavor is, is the Cadillac of apps yeah. of this type. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people just use the built-in reminders in their phone. Um, or, you know, the WatchMinder will do a lot of what Endeavor does. Yeah. It just won't be on your device or your computer. All right, great. Um, someone wanted to know, if, did you mention a specific air purifier or um, the name of an air purifier when you were talking? Did one of you mention something? Yeah, the one that was pictured is called the Molecule, uh, and it's spelled a little differently than you would expect. Uh, where you would expect to see a C in the word Molecule, you'll instead see a K. And um, you can actually find that uh, on our website, or we can send you a link from the JAN database. But it's just an example. We don't endorse or recommend products here at JAN. Uh, this just happens to be a the newest, latest, and greatest, according to its advertising, at least, in terms of air purifiers. And that's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E. -E. All right, great. And um, I'm going to combine some of these questions. Several people had questions about um, other assistive technology options for, for example, for people with ADHD or um, more information on where to find state AT projects. Um, other other options. Can one of you talk about our A to Z list and how to find more information? Yes, on askjan.org. If you go to A to Z, by topic, under resources, we have every state assistive technology project linked under there. If you go, again, A to Z, by topic, and go under assistive technology, we have all types of um, products and equipment linked there. Yeah, and you can also uh, look under A to Z by limitation or by the disability involved uh, and find solutions for many, many different types of conditions. And if you have trouble finding something, you can always call us or email us. Someone would be happy to send you the information or walk you to it on the internet. All right. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I wanted to mention one last question because I want to plug our upcoming solution videos. Um, somebody asked for a free and readily readily available way to zoom in and out on the computer, um, and we just did a couple of solution videos on accessibility features of the iPad and micro Windows, Microsoft. So um, we want to plug those just because we think they're very helpful. There's a lot of other ones that are already available, and there's going to be more coming. 
So to find those, you go to our homepage, which, as Lisa mentioned, is askjan.org. Click on the Training tab, and then go to the Jan YouTube channel. And you can find all of those, um, the ones I just mentioned about the iPad accessibility and Windows. Windows operating is, those two are not up yet, are they? They are coming soon. So check out what we have and look for the new ones to be coming soon. And uh, that's all the time we have. I want to thank Teresa and Lisa for excellent presentation with lots and lots of good information about assistive technology. And as they said, you know, there are lots of other things, and we can help you on a case-by-case -case basis if you want to give us a call. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And we also want to thank Alternative Communication Services for providing the net captioning. We do hope this program was useful. Um, as mentioned earlier, an evaluation form is going to automatically pop up on your screen in another window as soon as we're finished. We really appreciate your feedback, so please just take a minute to complete that form. This concludes today's webcast.